All right, all right. Let, let's go ahead and get started back into the wonderful world of reinforced concrete design. So we had uh, last time off um, because of the ASC Virginia's conference, which uh, all in all was a lot of fun. I think your students did uh, very well at that. Um, a couple of things before uh, we actually uh, get back into this today. So um, let's see. So I've got some, there was a couple of homeworks that I think didn't get passed out or somebody didn't get, uh, let's see, Mr. Stacks. And then, actually, I think that's it. That was simple. Um, all right. Um, okay, I went through that uh, sign-in sheet from last time and then based off of what you said you were missing. Um, so let's see. Uh, Let's see, you were missing, I think it was this one. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, all right. And then um, I got your email. I, I haven't had a chance to look at it. But. All right, um, let's see, you're missing this one. And then I'm thinking this one. Um, This one, I thought I had another one, I'm sorry. All right, this is yours. But then I, I thought I printed, did anybody get two designed for RC beams? Because I thought I had two with me. Because you put one on there, but I thought I brought another one, I'm sorry. I'll bring that next time, all right? Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Go ahead and get the attendance sheet started out. Um, <coughs> now, before I actually start reviewing the lecture notes, I do actually want to take uh, time first and go back into that example that we did last time because um, I think that's actually a more relevant um, point of discussion to get us started. So that last problem that we did was focused around looking at immediate deflection. So I want to take some time and, and recap that because we're, today we're going to do long-term deflections and I want you all to see the difference. I do have a homework for you all today once, you, once we finish this, but I mean, it's two problems. This is a, this is a pretty straightforward assignment. So, this problem we, yeah. That's a good question. Um, the, the reason why is there's a, um, uh, there's a number of ways that we can um, account for dead load deflection. Um, and we can do things like camber uh, and what have you. Um, in pre-stress, you can, you, you can account for that pretty easily. When you're in the building mode and you're actually constructing a building, you can account for dead load deflection pretty easily. In, in other words, like, like let's take th this drop ceiling and all the plumbing and electrical and all that stuff installed uh, and what have you. Once it's installed under the dead load, it's good. The only deflection that you can't account for you know, during construction is the live load. Like, let, I, I tend to think of it in terms of, of a bridge because I, I think it's a little easier. Um, have you all ever heard of the term cambering? I'm actually going to use, probably going to be a little bit more of a, a steel topic, but uh, it, it, the same point will get across. Have you ever heard of the to uh, concept of cambering? Okay, so here's what it means to camber. When you take a, a structure like a bridge and you subject it to its own self-weight, it deflects under its own self-weight. Okay. So what you can then do is say, all right, let's say it deflects, oh, I don't know, two inches, okay? You can take the beams and literally physically bend them upwards two inches so that when you set them down, they're bent upwards two inches, they deflect downwards two inches, and they sit flat. You can do that for dead loads. You can't do that for live loads. You, you see what I mean? Because live loads are variable. They don't change. You can do the same thing for concrete. You can either 
pour over, pour over a little bit larger so that it, it, the slab sits flat, or you can cast them, if you're looking at precast systems, you can cast them with a little bit of camber. That, that's possible too. But you can't do that for live loads. That's why all of your deflection limits are based off of occupancy. So you got you to you think about it like this. Um, deflection limits are meant to ensure the intended use of the structure, that the structure is meeting its intended performance. There are different deflection limits for, let's say, a typical office building than there are for, let's say, some lab that's uh, supporting high-precision machinery. You, you see what I mean? Like, um, there, there's this, um, there's this. I think it's at Virginia Tech, but there's this lab, and, and I remember hearing the story that there's this lab that, that um, does a lot of laser research and, and, and optical effects of lasers at, at Virginia Tech, and they can only do their experimental studies like Saturday night at 9 o'clock because you know who's in a, a school building Saturday night at 9 o'clock? Nobody. Just having the people in the building creates enough ambient vibration that they, they can't do their, their studies, so they have to wait till everybody's gone so they can do the work. Um, so deflection limits are meant for intended use, but they're a function of the occupancy. That's why they're related to the live loads, not so much the dead load. We can overcome dead load deflection using a number of different means, cambering, overpours, shoring, stuff like that. We got options. We can't do that with live load because it's, it's variable. Well, we're not doing that in here. We're calculating the dead load and then the dead plus live and taking the difference to get the live load deflection. Why would you live because again, that, that's what I was saying just a moment ago, that the, the deflection limits, the limits on that deflection are a function of the occupancy of the building, a function of what the building is being used for. Do you really care that some storage rack, let's say in a grain silo, deflects as a function or you know when you compare it to something like a, a floor in an office building or the floor that supports the MRI machine in the hospital you, you see what I mean it's a different story you, you see what I mean it's not the same situation that's why li deflection limits are a function of the occupancy what that room is being used for and how do we represent loads that relate to occupancy those are live loads that's what they are does that did I answer your question ish Good. Oh, okay. You might have to retrofit. I mean, you might have to go in and do some work. It's very possible. You might have to strengthen some beams, add some, you know. FRP wraps or what have you. If we're talking about concrete, you may have to install additional elements. I mean, that happens. Um, there are companies that have made a fair amount of money specializing in that. There's a company called, and I know this gets, this is more steel world than concrete, but there's a company called Simpson Strong Tie, and they make this sort of prefabricated moment frame. It's about you know, probably about us from here, from the floor to the ceiling, and about, let's say, from here to right about here. It's literally like a square moment frame. And the purpose is, you know, let's say you've got some apartment complex or what have you that's in San Diego that needs to be strengthened for seismic requirements. That they'll sell you this prefabricated kit that you go in and install, and it, you know, strengthens the structure for seismic demand, and, and they do very well. <laughs> you, you know, so. Find a problem like that, excel at it, and you, you might be uh, owning a private jet in the not too distant future. That's the plan. <laughs> but yeah, to, to answer, to, to go back to, um, to your question um, a little, in a, just generally, we can, we can overcome dead load deflection with other means like cambering, what have you. We don't need to define limits based on dead load deflection because we can overcome it. We can't overcome live load deflection solely because it's variable and because it's a function of what the building's being used for. Sound good? I think you got it. Okay, all right. 
All right, let me get back to this example because I want to um, try and explain what's going on here. So we were in this example looking at immediate live load deflections. Now, you cannot compute immediate live load deflections directly. You must think of stage construction. The beam first sees its dead load, and then it sees its dead load plus its live load. So you calculate the dead load deflection, the total load deflection, subtract the two to get the effects caused by just the live load. Okay? So we calculated a gross moment of inertia, a cracking moment, and a transformed section moment of inertia here, here, and here. None of that changes for the rest of the problem because the cracking moment is the cracking moment, the moment of inertia is the moment of inertia, and so on. The only thing that changes are your applied moments, MA. MA will cause your effective moment of inertia to alter, which will cause your, dead, or your deflections to, to change. So I sort of struck a line and say, okay, now the problem gets unique. So we first handle the dead load deflection. We say, all right, here's the applied moments. What didn't we apply here? What's missing? Well, live, but what, what else is missing? It's a dead load. What did I not put on here? 1.2, I didn't factor it. You do not factor loads according to deflections, okay? Deflections are not a safety concern. They're more of an intended use serviceability type issue. You do not apply load factors, all right? Using that applied moment, we calculate an effective moment of inertia and get the following moment of inertia. Using consistent units, we calculate the center line dead load deflection, 5 WL to the fourth over 384 EI. E being the modulus of elasticity of the concrete, I being the moment of inertia we just computed. 5 WL to the fourth, everything in kips and inches, there's your deflection. Now that's due to the dead load. We then do the total load, the dead plus the live, and then same process, get the dead plus the live, subtract the two to get immediate deflections due to just the live load. Sound good? Now. That is if I took the load, placed it on the beam, what is the deflection right now, right as soon as I put the load on the beam. Take that load and set it there for 30 years, that deflection will increase because concrete is a material whose property changes over time, okay? Concrete undergoes creep, it undergoes shrinkage issues, undergoes humidity changes, temperature changes. Concrete's properties change over time. It's just one of the things about concrete. Now, when it comes to live load deflections, what we have to do is ask ourselves how much of those deflections are sustained over time. That's one um, interesting issue we have to consider. So if you're looking at, let's say, a library, and you're looking at the floor, uh, the portion of the library that is supporting the book stacks, well, that live load might be 150 pounds per square foot, in addition to that, a question might be arised, well, how much of that 150 pounds per square foot is going to be there all day, every day? And the answer is 100%, because that, you know, those books are, for the most part, always going to be there. That's assuming they're not getting checked out on a regular basis, college students checking books out. <laughs> but in all, I mean, all honesty, that's a question worth considering. Now, if we're talking about a classroom, I mean, Let's take this room. I mean, um, it, it doesn't hold as much credence because we're not on the first floor, but or we're not on the second floor or third floor. We're on the first floor. So this load is getting transferred directly to the ground. But um, take the people in this room. I mean, the people in here are going to leave, okay? And then a new class is going to come in. But there's still going to be the tables, the chairs, the lectern, the computers, if this is a computer lab. So maybe I design this classroom for 40 pounds per square foot, but when I'm looking at deflections, maybe I want to say, you know, really only about 20% of that load is going to be there all day, every day, you know. It's not the same story as the library or the storage warehouse or what have you. Make sense? So because of that, I might say, well, an office building, a classroom, they might only see 20% of the load. Is there a clear, crisp, concise answer for what case you use where? No. Engineering judgment. Use your noggin. You know, what do you think uh, is the right answer, all right? That's why they give you those licenses when you prove that you're uh, capable of holding them. Make sense? What? Minimally competent. Minimally competent. Oh, 
Sometimes you scare me with some of those comments, Mr. Yukonek. I'm just saying. I'm just going to reserve my comments. <laughs> All right. Um, now, the way that ACI handles the difference between immediate deflections and long-term deflections is through the use of this adjustment factor incorporating this symbol that you thought I made up. Um, <laughs> now, that is the Greek letter xi. Um, basically, what we do is we take our immediate deflections and we adjust them by what's inside the parentheses. Now, that rho uh, prime is uh, related to the compression steel in the beam. Remember doubly reinforced sections? Remember you had steel on the bottom and steel on the top? Well, if you have steel on the top, tests have shown you get a little bit of a benefit in long-term deflection. So we, we can incorporate that. Now, if you don't have any compression steel, then rho prime is zero, and everything in the parentheses just turns into the made-up symbol, right? How do you look up the made-up symbol? You look it up based off this curve. There's a few values interpolated for listing, but if it's like 36 months or 30 months or 24 months, just use your best judgment, you know? Make sense? Okay. All right. So here's what we have. We have dead load deflections. We have live load deflections, which we can't compute directly. We have to take the total dead plus live and take off the dead. And then we have sustained live load. You know, 20% of that live load is going to be there the whole time. 100% of that live load is going to be there the whole time. So we take dead loads, live loads, and sustained live loads and plug them into the following expression. So our total deflection, when it's all said and done, is we take our immediate live load deflection, we add adjusted dead load deflection to account for that effect of the dead loads, okay? And our uh, sustained live loads adjusted by the effect of the duration. So this might go back to a question you asked before. You are accounting for that dead load effect in your long-term deflections. You are accounting for it. Okay. Now, one of the things you'll notice is when I'm looking at sustained live loads, I'm, I say, okay, maybe only 20% of that live load's there the whole time. But I say, when I say the whole time, maybe I'm being a little fast and loose with my terminology. Maybe what I really mean to say is that 20% of that load, it's there maybe for about 12 months. You know, it's sustained all the time. Or maybe it's only there for six months or 36 months. That's just a function of the use of the building. You know, is that load going to be there temporarily? Is that room going to undergo uh, restructuring or renovation? Just depends on what's going on. Um, now, if you notice, the dead loads, however, I'm multiplying those based off of an infinite duration. In other words, I'm saying the dead loads are always going to be there, which is the case, right? That beam, as long as it's there, it ain't going anywhere, right? It is always going to be subjected to its dead load. So I take the dead load and I adjust it by a multiplier based off of infinite duration. Go off of this curve, and if this curve goes all the way out to infinity, that multiplier becomes Two, right? For a sustained live load, it's a function of whatever that duration is. Make sense? All right. Now, okay. Let's look at deflection limits, okay? Now, this is one thing that I think the concrete industry has done very well, is they have codified their deflection limits. The steel industry not so much. The steel industry leaves the deflection limits up to what I'll call semi-debate. In, in other words, there are suggested limits, and by and large, they are used. But if the owner says, no, 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 I want this deflection limit or that, as long as they agree upon it, that's what you're using. Concrete, however, they do sort of codify it. They say, this is the deflection limit. So. Let's look at flat roofs not supporting or attached to uh, structural elements likely to be damaged by large deflections. What's the deflection that we consider? Immediate deflection due to the live load, and the limit is L over 180. So what we would do is, let's say that example 14A we were just looking at, what was the live load deflection at the end? It was like 0.225. You would compare that against the span length of the beam divided by 180, and then you say, 
Well, if, if that deflection's smaller than the limit, you're good. Otherwise, you're bad. See, a lot of these deflection limits are fairly empirical in nature and come from a lot of just gut feeling and know-how among the construction industry. For instance, how many of you have ever been into a, a house or a building and you've seen plastered roofs? You ever seen that? Yeah, y'all have seen that, right? You know, it's got the little plaster roofs that kind of drips down. You got the little, almost like the little spiky, little spiny things. Yeah, y'all have seen that before, right? Well. One very common deflection limit is L over 360. And you see it right here. And this is for interior floor beams and buildings, the deflection limit is L over 360. The reason that deflection limit came about is you start getting deflections larger than L over 360, and what you find is that plaster starts to crack. That, that's where the deflection came from, the deflection limit came from. Again, if that plaster cracks, does that mean the building is coming down? No, it just means that it, the building's not performing its intended function. Is it a feasible and reasonable limit for those types of buildings? Absolutely. Does it mean the building's coming down? Of course not. That's why you don't apply your load factors. Okay. Now, for roof systems, the deflections are a little more loose, like you, you can allow the roofings to deflect a little more. Um, for flat roof systems not supporting structural elements likely to be damaged, L over 180. For floors, L over 360, and those are live load deflection limits. Now, for total deflections, accounting for those long-term effects, the deflection limits get a little more stringent depending on the type of system that you're looking at. Make sense? Oh, that, that's in your book. I did sort of cut the table off a little bit. It's on page, hold on, let me find it. Uh, Give me a moment. It's on page 153. Um, if I were to include it, it would squunch in a little bit. Um, it, I'll say this. I, I don't want to get too into the details because a lot of this stuff doesn't really matter for the purposes of what we're doing. But there are things about ponding and some other time-dependent related stuff. But by and large, we don't have to worry too much about it. Have I ever described ponding to you all? Well, actually kind of, yeah. So here's what ponding is. Ponding is sort of a second order effect generated by loads. And, and the idea is this. Let's say it's raining. You have some water going onto your roof system, right? Well, what happens? The water causes it to deflect, right? That deflection leaves more room for water. So you get more water. What happens when you get more water? You get more deflection. More deflection means more water. More water means more deflection. See, see what I mean? That's called ponding. Um, we don't really need to worry about it too much. If you properly ensure drainage, it, it tends to not be that big of a deal. What? Well, there's a different, okay. I'm going to get to your second thing. There, flat roofs are, that might be a little misleading. If you take a roof and you put a 2% slope on it, that is more than enough for drainage. But for the purposes of wind calcs and snow calcs and things like that, you can assume it to be flat. That's what they mean by flat roof. What is, what's the building over here that has the, I think it's like the science building? That's not a flat roof. <laughs> It does, it does, but when I say, I'm, when, I, when this says flat roofs, it's talking about like that. Like we're talking about inclines that are less than what you would find on a handicap ramp. You, you see what I mean? Well, I was going to say, it's, it's a little bit of a filtration system. It kind of slows down your runoff a little bit. And B, the H and H, after a while, the H and H stuff, I say go ask Dr. Ford. <laughs> but, um, but honestly, it slows down your runoff a little bit. And it, it kind of acts as a filtration system so you don't get a bunch of junk in your you know, gutters and what have you.
Hey, I'm not an H and H. Don't ask me. You know. That's what was that. What that was the 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 funny part. Wow. All right. Uh, did did I answer your question? Okay. All right. Um. Usually, roof systems will be there'll be like a little bit of gravel, but then there's like a like a, a neoprene rubber sheet that kind of acts as an insulation membrane, and then you'll have like metal deck, and that's it. So very rarely will you see roof systems that actually have um, like uh, like concrete, sorry, like concrete slabs. That's pretty rare, except in some cases, like if, if it's uh, like a like a hospital and you have a helicopter landing pad or something. But then it, it's it's a different story altogether. So. But are you talking about just those little pavers or a full out slab? That, that's a different story. <laughs> and and that roof was designed for that. Like they knew that was going to be installed. It, it wasn't just, oh, by the way, let's let's install a green roof. And that that's a great question. I helped a, a graduate student in environmental science actually do a study of Drinko um, to determine whether or not it would be feasible to install a green roof system on this. It's like on the third floor that the, there's like a little balcony area. And it's actually a perfect spot for a green roof because what they did is they took the floor system that was in the library and just extended it out, you know, a few more feet. Which, look at that floor system and it's massive. Why? It's a library. It's got to support, you know, 150 pounds per square foot, you know, with no live load reduction. So all, in order to, you know, make construction more feasible and easier to do, they just took the floor system and just, just carry it out a little bit. That's a perfect place for a green roof because that system can support, like, book stacks, <laughs> let alone just, a, you know, some plant material. Honestly, there's, there's two big reasons. Number one, um, something about students and, I mean, engineering, maybe it's a depressing field and you, know, you go out. <laughs> that's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> no, but, but in all seriousness, they, I, I think the, the big thing is they just don't want cigarette butts out there. So. Yeah. So. But honestly, I, I think that's it. So. Don't feel bad. I sit on the, the university level committee that did a lot of organization for it, even though I don't have access to it. So don't feel bad. My card doesn't work. So don't feel bad. Don't get me started. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because I would like to get a little bit of head work done on this example. Because I am going to give you this regardless. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and give you this now before I forget it. Um, okay, all right. I was just checking to make sure when it was due. Okay, Let, let's take a little bit of a look at this example so that we can kind of continue our, our discussion on serviceability. So on 14A, we were given dead loads and given live loads, and we were asked to compute an immediate live load deflection. For this example, our task is a little different. We have to take some of the math that we did in 14A and expand upon it. So. We're going to say that this floor beam is attached to elements likely to be damaged by structural deflections. Um, so that's going to be a deflection limit of L over 480. And um, in addition, 
we're going to consider that 30% of this live load is sustained for a period of three years. So keep in mind what we did in the previous example. We did uh, immediate dead load deflections, dead plus total live to get the immediate total live load deflection. Now we're going to have to consider this sustained live load to get the total uh, dead load deflection across the board. So let's go to this example and let's sort of continue on a little bit. All right. All right, so let's recall a couple things from 14A before we, before we move on. So right. So right off the bat, I want to get the dead load deflection and the live load deflection. Y'all remember that? What was it? 0 0.245. And was it 0 0.222? 223. Oh, okay. Wow. Not that big of a difference, but you know. Okay. Now, um, let's see. We're also going to need some material properties and section properties for the concrete. So help me out, what was the modulus of elasticity of the concrete? I'm making y'all do a little bit of investigation. That's the big thing with a lot of these deflection examples. They're not complicated as much as they are just, you know, bookkeeping uh, issues. Like you just got to make sure you're organized. There we go. All right. All right, help me out with those. We had a gross moment of inertia and a cracked moment of inertia. And then let's go ahead and give you that one. All right. And then we have a, a dead load of one kit per foot, a live load of two kit, or nope, sorry, I'm looking at them, sort of thinking ahead to another problem. And then the span length was what, 20 feet? All right. Here, let me, let me redo that. Okay, so what I want to do is I kind of want to summarize the deflection calcs and then, uh, you know, sort of streamline it a little bit to keep our organization a, a little easier. So, deflection calcs. All right, so... We're going to have a table. It might be kind of long, so bear with me. All right. We're going to take each case one at a time and sort of summarize what we did so that when you see what I'm about to do, you'll kind of be able to make that connection pretty easily. Okay? So case, our first case, we did just the dead load deflection. So what was the applied load? 
What did we do last time? What was our applied load? Just the one kit per foot, right? Well, no, that, that's the moment. I'm, I'm getting to that. Now, what was the applied moment? 50, there we go. All right, now, what was our effective moment of inertia? Was it 4188 point something or just 98.3? Right. And then what was our deflection? Point two four five, right? Is that right? What? Oh, oh. For the dead load, ah, okay, okay. Oh no, it's fine, it's fine. Forty-seven thirteen point oh seven. So about that. So did you all see what we did in that last case? We took this dead load, calculated a moment, then plugged it into that expression to get an effective moment of inertia, 5WL is a fourth over 384 EI to get that. Are you all okay with that? Okay. Now the next case we did was dead plus live, which, what was our load? What did our load end up being? 1.7. Now, I know this is going to sound silly, but how did we get the 1.7? Just walk me through that. Okay, all right. There's a reason I asked that. Okay. Now, what was the resulting moment? 85. That moment yielded an effective moment of inertia of what? And then a deflection of what? Okay, all right. Now, looking at me like, why are you asking that? There is a reason why, why I did that. Okay, now, I want to calculate the dead plus the sustained live load. How much of that live load is sustained? 30%, right? So how am I gonna calculate this? Here we did dead plus live. How am I gonna calculate the dead plus the sustained? 1 plus 30% of that. So I'm going to say dead plus 30% of live or dead plus the sustained live load. So what does that give us? One point two one. So when you see me write this just one point two one, well how the heck did you get that? Everybody okay with that? Now, one point two one, how are we going to calculate the moment? It's a simply supported beam uniformly distributed load. How do you get the moment? WL squared over eight. So what is that? There we go. Is everybody okay with that? I'm sort of just streamlining the calcs a little bit just to keep it simple. Now, before we continue, do you all know how to compute the effective moment of inertia or do you need me to go through it again? I mean, I, I feel it's pretty plug and chug. Is that okay? All right. If you do that, you will get a, a value of 40... 431.6 if you do that. And 5WL to the 4th over 384EI, using that as your I, using that as your W, you'll get 0 0.315 inches. 
Now, one thing I'll put over here to the side, how did we calculate live load deflection? We took dead plus live minus the dead and got 0 0.223, right? How do we calculate sustained live load deflection? There you go, this minus that. Okay, so. So that minus that will give you about. Now, that is sustained live load deflection, but it's still immediate. We haven't taken into account the time effect, okay? That's what we have to do next, okay? We have to recognize that that deflection is going to increase over time. That we will do next time. But do you all understand this? There's actually a lot of math behind the background in what you're seeing here, so I want to make sure you understand that. Everybody good? All right. Well, that's all I have for you all today. I will see you all next time. You all do still have a homework. The homework still due on Monday because what we're about to do on Wednesday will only take like five minutes. It's not that complicated. And then we get into development link.